These are my disclosures. So this is the outline of my talk. Briefly, um, how we can characterize DNA repair deficiency in cancer. What are the examples of the most commonly uh, deficient tumors in GI uh, cancers? What is the prevalence in GI cancers? And what therapeutic current approaches currently are available? So just very briefly, we know that there's DNA damage all the time, double-stranded breaks, single-stranded breaks, et cetera. And cancer cells are very sophisticated in how they use those different pathways for their gain, for proliferation or for differentiation. And they can also use those pathways and compensate those pathways during the course of the disease for their benefit. And that's how they can actually develop therapeutic um, resistance over the course of time. So when we stop and we think about DNA damage repair in cancer, we also have to think about when we're looking at those tumor cells, how much heterogeneity there is in those cancer cells, if it's at an early stage or at a more advanced stage. This is true for all cancer cells, but specifically also for the DNA damage repair pathway. So there's different types of repair to the different types of DNA damage that we have. And there's also overlapping repair pathways when the DNA is damaged. And this is really a very complex um, system. And there's, this is coined the DNA damage response. Let's think about how we can characterize DNA damage repair deficient tumors in GI. So we can just think about the clinical phenotype. All of us see patients in our clinics. And sometimes we have patients that come in that have a different response, a deeper, more durable response to platinum-based treatments. We would look at these as outlier patients. In some of these patients, we will also see that they aggregate with familial syndromes. They will have additional family members with cancer-related tumors as well. In some of those families, we can find specific mutations. In some of them, we can't. And we know that in a lot of familial syndromes, there's an aggregation of DNA repair alterations. So it kind of makes sense. That's just from the clinical perspective. Let's think about the genomic perspective. So we know that there are commercial tools available today. The next generation sequencing, most of us are, um, um, are, you know, work with that. A lot of our patients come and actually ask us to do those tests. Some of our institutions have those tests as available. Um, and that's just at the like, kind of the first level. And we can go into a more sophisticated exome sequencing and whole genome sequencing in order to define and identify a tumor with, D with DNA repair deficiency. More characterization. What about genomic instability? So cancer cells, some of them, have loss of their genome integrity. And this is also called genomic instability. There's two ways we, this can happen, amongst others. One is that there's chromosomal instability, as one can see on your right. And this is characterized by major chromosomal and structural rearrangements and mutations. For some tumors, for example, for pancreatic cancer, we know that when we see this kind of genome, it's more likely to be linked to a brachinous phenot phenotype genotype with aggregation of alterations in genes in the, in the germline, or not germline, somatic also, BRCA or BRCA-like pathway. And we know that in some of these case, cases, the response to platinum is quite well connected. However, what this means in other tumor GI subtypes, like in gastric cancer, I think this is well this is not as recognized as what this means to the tumor and how this relates to response to platinum treatment. And we have to think when we go forward how we can, you know, discover those connections overall amongst the GI tract. And then we have genomic instability due to microcytolate instability, the, mis the mismatch repair, a high phenotype with defects in the mismatch repair genes, and this is more linked to immunotherapeutic strategies. What about the prevalence of DDR deficiency in GI cancer? So let's start with mismatch repair. Um, one can see in this pivotal study, um, in red blocks, I've, you can see the different, um, the, the prevalence of mismatch repair across all of malignancies, gastric, small intestinal, colorectal being more prevalent, and then much less prevalence as we go down the GI tract. 
And of course, we've spoken about the two therapeutic approaches to these two subtypes. So mismatch repair genes, we know that these are important proteins. They spell check. Um, the, the, the synthesized DNA, and if there's a problem, if the mismatch repair proteins are, there's a problem in the way they work, then we have these repeating microsatellite sequences. Specifically the Lynch syndrome, um, but mismatch repair deficiency can be tested or by PCR or by IHC, and I know that there's um, a session on this also, um, I think tomorrow on Saturday, and for most cases, when we want to differentiate if it's a mismatched somatic event only or a germline, we have, to, we have to go and test for the germline event only as well. The rationale for immunotherapy in mismatch repair is very well recognized. We know that in these tumors, there's a higher percentage of mutation-associated neoantigens, and that really explains how these tumors respond to anti-PD-1 and anti-PD-1 antibodies. In the pivotal study um, presented by Lee in Science, and this really led to the agnostic um, uh, um, approval of MSI in tumors by the FDA. I know that in different countries, this is not always, uh, this is not the same approval, but we can see that there's really a nice response in the GI tract for, for um, checkpoint inhibition um, uh, uh, strategies. Important to notice, and probably all of us have this as well, we've all seen patients now that we've treated um, in the GI tract with mismatch uh, repair and checkpoint inhibitors. And once again, here as well, we're not seeing the same responses. Um, I've seen patients with very advanced disease that don't often um, actually respond. Sometimes early in the, pro in, the, in, in the course of the disease, we're seeing a higher response. And we have to try and understand that more. And the big hype today in the phase one programs is all the combinations of IO in the subset of patients as well. Let's focus a bit on um, HRD. So the BRCA1 and 2 genes discovered in the early 1990s were really the most, um, they're the most uh, uh, um, uh, the, the genes that we've seen the most um, experience and we understand them the most, and these genes really predispose to malignancies of the ovarian cancer, um, breast cancer, prostate cancer, pancreatic cancer, and we're also seeing in gastric cancer and cholangial cancer and maybe others, but it's kind of below the radar. Even in pancreatic cancer, we didn't realize that the prevalence is as high as we thought. A little bit about these subtypes in pancreatic cancer. So we know that when we see an unstable genome, we see an aggregation, an enrichment of the BRAC and the BRCA-like genes, as I said earlier. And additional studies have also shown that when you see this, what they call them, the double-stranded break repair genomes, also known as the unstable genomes, it's the same, it's a same ter terminology, it's a different terminology for the same kind of defect. There's a aggregation of DNA damage repair pathways and these specific genes like BRCA1, BRCA2, PELB2, and others. So this is a case report of a patient of mine that came in with, um, one can see a lesion in the tail of his pancreas, liver metastases. We started him on Fulfurinox. He had a beautiful and deep response, an almost complete response. He then went on to receive a laparib, and he had um, a disease for interval of almost two and a half years until his disease progressed, and he died three years later. Um, what is the global pre prevalence of germline BRCA mutation? Originally, it was thought to be around 4 to 5%. Today, with global screening of over 3,000 patients from the polar trial, the numbers is around a 7 to 8%. However, in familial pancreatic cancer patients, we can see a much higher prevalence, up to 15 to 20%. What do we know about germline BRCA uh, mutations? In pancreatic cancer, retrospective studies have shown that when these patients receive platinum-based treatments, they have more than a doubling in the overall survival. So what we're really seeing here is that germline BRCA mutation seems to be the predictive biomarker to platinum treatment. Other data from us and other groups have shown that it's less, less a prognostic marker. So we have to be really thoughtful about identifying these patients and giving them the right treatment. Um, DNA repair is more error prone when the BRCA 
um, genes are deficient. And we can use that, um, that knowledge further using the PARP, the PARP inhibitors. And what they actually do is that they, are, they inhibit the PARP enzyme and they also trap the PARP on the DNA. The POLAR study that we presented yesterday has shown a, um, an improvement in progression-free survival in patients with this maintenance strategy of giving chemotherapy for several months, kind of lowering the tumor burden, and then initiating a maintenance strategy and seeing a, a progression-free survival interval um, delayed and, and an improvement in PFS over the course of time, which is really quite durable. And what's nice about these patients in those that respond, it's at least for two years. However, even in our germline BRCA mutation patients, which is quite a clear subset of identified patients, not all our patients are responding in the predictive manner that we think. And we've got to be careful about not just aggregating patients together and just predicting how they're going to respond. And one can see that in the responders, um, we're trying to look now at the genomic events what plays out in their tumors and why they're responding. Obviously, loss of heterozygosity um, and other events are, are important. And in the non-responders, trying to understand that as well. But when you look at this, also one must think, once again, when we're seeing our patient over the course of time and what's happening in his tumor in relation to that complex overlapping of DNA da damage repair pathways that he's going to initiate and compensate for over the course of time. So when we biopsy a, tu a patient's tumor at the beginning, before we initiate platinum-based treatment, maybe it's two years on platinum-based treatment before we uh, initiate a different type of DNA damage repair, his tumor at that time point may not reflect his actual biology. And we have to be, th we have to be thoughtful about that as well. So um, this is nice work from Steve Gallinger's group, and it's identified that in patients with this, what they call the double-stranded break repair genomes, or also known as unstable genomes, there's an aggregation of, D of, um, uh, of immune proteins. And one can see there on the, on the right side, there's an aggregation, and that's in mismatch repair genomes and also in DNA damage repair from, um, from BRCA patients. And this has really kind of led to maybe where the field's going next in regard to HRD. Um, and one can see that there's also a higher PDL1 expression in these tumors as well. And this was nice work presented by Mike uh, Pishmian, who's going to be in the next uh, session as well, from Know Your Tumor Database. And this is really asking the question we've spoken about germline BRCA mutations, but what about somatic events? And Elena uh, O'Reilly also spoke about this yesterday for Memorial that there's about a 15-16% of what we would define today as being um, mutations on the DNA damage repair pathways in pancreatic cancer. And what Mike's shown also that in these patients, when they're treated with a platinum agent, they have a prolonged overall survival. And his data in advanced disease is very similar to the data that we have shown in BRCA mutated um, advanced cancer as well. So we're seeing that identifying genes that have more DNA damage repairs is important, at least in pancreatic cancer, and treating those patients with platinum seems to be beneficial for them. However, DNA deficient tumors that are responding to platinum will not necessarily respond to a PARP inhibitor. This is a different pathway, it's very specific, and there has to be a dependency on that pathway. And if that is not the compensating pathway, then that strategy is not going to work. And all of us kind of rushing ahead in the field, you know, trying to look for the other subtypes that may respond to PARP inhibitors, we've got to keep that in mind. We are seeing BRCA germline and somatic mutations in cholangia carcinoma as well with a prolonged overall survival in some patients when treated with similar strategies as in pancreatic cancer. And we're also seeing that in gastric cancer, similar signals as well. However, these are very small cohorts, and they have to be validated in bigger studies. So what do we know about the prevalence of DNA damage repair mutations in GI tumors? So let's first start about how we would define, once again, 
a DDR deficient tumor. So this is the list of genes that was defined in this study. So one can argue, is that the final list? Is that the whole list? Should it be a bigger list or should it be a tighter list? We don't really know. And it's okay because we're still defining these populations. But when we do look across the studies and the literature and when we, when we design our own clinical trials, we have to be very thoughtful about that, going back to that they're not all going to be equal and respond equally. What's quite interesting is that the biliary tract, pancreatic and colon cancers are around 10% and gastroesophageal cancers being around 20%. Luckily, there's a lot of different DNA damage or drugs, drugs in development today, and we can really go back to this list, and it's evolving and getting bigger all the time, and we can really think about not just defining more accurately that subpopulation of DNA-deficient patients across the GI tract, but what kind of combinations make sense of combining. And lastly, to conclude, um, I think that this is still an evolving field, and there may be differences between different tumor subtypes. For example, as I said, you know, what does chromosomal instability mean in a gastric cancer? I'm not sure. I think we're more clear about that in pancreatic cancer. Um, and that to date, the DNA damage repair subtypes are mostly well defined for the germline BRCA and maybe going on for the somatic BRCA and the MSI, of course. Um, and once again, just to remember that, and I think that this is you know, a mistake we, we kind of see in the field the whole time, that we just kind of you know, expect to see any DDR um, agent that's responding to platinum may respond to PARP, and we've got to stop in our tracks and really you know, consider if that's going to be, and we can do those clinical trials, but then we have to have enough exploratory endpoints to be really, you know, getting to them at the different time points to be able to look at that question in a more accurate way. Um, so thank you very much.